I had a picture that I was going through some of my files and kind of downsizing some of my files, throwing some stuff away and keeping some stuff. And I ran across a, a picture that I had that I used sometimes in, in teaching. And it was a, a, little, a little child <clears throat> holding its head and down at the bottom where words come out of his mouth and says, this theology has given me a headache. <laughs> and I thought I'd bring that tonight, but I, I went down to find it, but uh, I put it somewhere else in another file. So uh, it was a cute, cute one. The, the class that I taught in theology, they always got a big kick out of it because a lot of people do get confused with theology. But you ever stop and realize that the Bible is our source book? And according to my understanding, it's still the number one seller in your bookstores. Now, of course, you've got a lot of uh, downgrades because you have a lot of uh, modifications. You have a lot of newer, modern translations. And you know as well as I do that every time you translate something, you take away from the original. Of course, we don't have the original that we can lean on. But we do have manuscripts going back to show us what the original was like unto. Because you remember that the original was with the Jews and remember that when Egypt was destroyed, uh, when Alexander went in there, what did he do? They, they destroyed the library. And so a lot of uh, Jewish history, a lot of documents on the Old Testament were burned up. And so the sages went and they started writing newer because of their knowledge on the old. But then when it was brought over into the Septuagint, there were words that the Greek did not have for the Hebrew. And so they changed the words in their language. And then the Latin did the very same thing. And so the Bible, even though it's our source book, we read it by our own mind rather than the mind of God. And it always amazed me that in salvation, God not only saved our soul, He quickened our, our faith, rebirthed our spirit, and by the Holy Spirit, not only inside, but coming alongside, He enables us to think through. And I'll touch a little bit on that as we, we go through this uh, tonight. But I was thinking about what to bring that might encourage us. Encourage us. And so I'm going to look at Peter for a little while. So turn your Bible to 1 Peter. Peter is very interesting to me. As I said, that the Bible is our source book, and in this source book, there's a lot of object lessons. There's a lot of pictures that are being painted, and then there are a lot of issues, situations that also show up that we can learn from. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and about verse 7, he had transferred to Apollos. You remember, Apollos was a very, very educated man, but he didn't know much about truth. And we found a couple people that took him aside and, and expounded to him the truth. And he became a great, powerful hand in the hands of God, also a companion of the Apostle Paul. And so there in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, he said he had transferred to Apollos, not to a think above. And the translation there is man, but if you notice that it's in the italicized, it's in the script. So he said not to think above that which is written. So, so what we have is here, we have a document that God has so designed to give to us, Jew as well as Gentile, that as we apply ourselves and as we read, our faith will increase. I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm still asking God to increase my faith. 
because there are still things that I don't know. There are still some questions that I have that are still not answered. But a lot of my questions have been answered right because of this document. And so when I study the Bible, I study individuals. Did you ever stop and realize that every individual was an individual, a real person, with a real temperament, with a real story to tell? And so when I study these individuals, I realize that I can observe them and I can kind of put myself in their situation. I can't get myself into their skin, but I can get myself into the situation and feel it out. So, so when I talk about Peter, it's amazing to me because he is the one that we really understand that understood the sifting of Satan. Remember there in Luke chapter 22, Jesus told him about verse 21, he says, Satan desires to sift you. You see, I, it, it bothers me today because a lot of people are being sifted by Satan and don't even know it. And they, 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 they put it down as intellectual value. But, but when they're explaining themselves, it is literally tearing, about, tearing down the spiritual. And we, you and I, have been given the, the privilege and the ability to compare spiritual things with spiritual things, to see things from God's perspective, and then to put up a guard according to intellectual <laughs> prestige because there are those especially in Calvinism and so forth will try to get you to think their way and if you're not careful and I've been there you'll get sucked right into it because they're so intellectual and they seem so wise and so smart but when you go to this book and you get on your knees and pray and say God help me to put up that caution help me to understand then you start seeing these roadblocks. And then you back away. And so those, these things are valuable, but this is, this is Satan sifting. Peter also interests me because he was the one that was with Jesus for three and a half years who denied Jesus. Who denied Jesus. I can't fathom that. Because even Jesus told him, he said, you're going to do that before the cock crows. The third time. He told him way before. And as soon as that cock crow crowed, Jesus was standing right there and he looked at Peter and Peter recognized and he went out and praised God. I, I'm thankful what it says. He wept bitterly there's a lot of people that deny Christ I'm talking about his people and don't realize it don't realize it and, and we've come we've come so far up the road that, that we have literally left a lot of divine principles back there and we need to get back on base one and get things back we talk about we need a revival. And it is true. We need a revival because Satan is working worse than he has ever been. And he knows exactly what people are looking for, even God's people, and he's giving them everything they want for the flesh. And their flesh is being pacified. <clears throat> But yet at the same time, Peter remembered the hilltop experience in Matthew chapter 17. Remember when Jesus was transfigured? And there stood Elijah? And there stood Moses? Peter got carried away and said, let us build three tabernacles. One for each one of you. 
That's a human thing. That's a human. So I could, I, I can identify with Peter as I began to look at him and see the things that's going on and identify to the point that even myself been sucked in. Even myself have been sifted. And even myself become ashamed at various times. I've been in my prayer closet asking the Lord how can we revitalize our worship? Revitalize our worship. We used to have good worship. Now we're going through routines. And that bothers me. But yet, when I take the Bible as my source book and look at things, the Lord really digs in and gives a lot of encouragement. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gunshot uh, Jan, uh, Peter for a little bit. What I mean by that is two individuals went squirrel hunting. One was half blind and one had a gun. So the half, the half blind man had the gun. And his buddy walked along with him and he said, there's a squirrel. And the half blind man shot and of course missed him. He said, there's another one. He missed him. He missed about four or five squirrels. He said, give me that gun. And he turned back and he said, show me one more. And he shot and he got the squirrel. The guy said, the only reason he got the squirrel is you aimed all over the whole tree. And sometimes that's the way it is when we're preaching is just aiming all over the tree. But if I do what I really want to do, we'll be here for a long time. And it's warm up here. So let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and listen to what he is saying. Now, I might get a little emotion because I do that now more than I used to. But Peter is writing to those who have been scattered abroad. These are Jewish believers. Okay? We'll come on, the, the, the Gentiles will come on the scene a little bit later. He's, he's writing to Jewish believers who are scattered. He's very concerned about them. We are, should be very concerned for both Jew and Gentile in our witnessing. It seems like we focus more on Gentile than Jew. But I want you to look with me at verse 3. But let's look at uh, verse 2 first. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, and obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now I, I, get shame, I get ashamed right there. Because I look at this verse and I see what God has done. And what, what he did through the Holy Spirit. You see there's a lot of people who don't understand how the Spirit of God worked. When you were saved... The Holy Spirit wanted to set you aside. When, when, when you took and you responded to his drawing and you repented of your sin and you identified with Christ in baptism, you were sanctified. You were set aside for God's purpose. Now you are a holy people in God's sight. Okay? Then, then, then he says... Then he says what? He says sanctified of the spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Grace is an, is an action word. You also find that the word peace is a continued word. Jesus said I give you peace. I leave it with you. Paul in Colossians says, let peace be the umpire of your life. If we don't have peace, then, then we're doing something that we're away from God and not allowing his peace to be the umpire ruling our life. 
Now he goes on, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to make both of those connections. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively, a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's why it says that, that if we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we've been born again. It's a positive. But there's a lot of people that don't get a hold of that. They, 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 they don't live their life in the newness of this relationship with God. They're staggering through life. And they just don't get it together. In the resurrection of Christ, there, there is an abundance of God's peace, an abundance of God's grace. Because he has taken us out of death and he has placed us in the life. He has taken us out of darkness and he has put, it, put us in life, in light. He has done everything. Now when you go to Isaiah and you look at Isaiah chapter 5, God to Isaiah says, this is what I did to Israel. It's like a chosen vine that I brought out of Egypt. And here's what I did. I went in and I cleaned up everything. I, I took out all the stones. I, I terraced, I, I put terraces uh, along the way. I, I, I so, divide, so designed the land that the water would run. It would do its benefit. And I planted these choice vines and I did all of this. And he said, what more could I have done? But when I looked, they didn't bring forth good grapes. They brought forth sour grapes. I want to ask you, please, what more could God have done when Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again for us? What, what more could God have done? Not only doing that, but when we repented of our sin and received Christ as our personal sin. I know I'm talking to the choir. There's a lot of people that need to be here to hear this. But God had done so much because not only did he save us, he gave us his spirit and the spirit comes alongside to enable us to be what he wants us to be. But then if we take our time and we really look the Bible over, we realize that Jesus told Nicodemus and Paul told us also in Romans chapter 8 that that which is of the flesh is flesh and that which is the spirit is spirit and those that mind the flesh are of the flesh we have a problem with that we say I know when so and so was saved no you do not there's only one person that I know when a person is saved and that's God the only evidence that we have is the fruit that they produce and I see a lot of people out there that say they're saved and their fruit is showing the opposite of their conduct and their actions going on. Am I correct on that? Even my family. So I can't honestly say that I know she's saved. Or I don't know if they are saved. God is the only one that knows that. But we are so prone to say, well, I know when they were No, you were not. See? But I want you to know it. Go with me. He goes on and he says what? He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope through the resurrection of Christ. Now watch this. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, receive it in heaven. For I have something in heaven that belongs to Christ, and Christ is going to share that with me and you, and it's called his divine inheritance. Can you grasp that? You see, you not only were adopted, in that adoption you were made a son or a daughter, just like Jesus is to the Father in the physical sense, and being a son or a daughter, you have full rights to that inheritance. Amen. Notice what he did, please. Notice what he did. 
goes on and says, who are kept, I love this, who are kept by the power of God through or on account of faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last days. You see, our salvation has been sealed in Christ, but it is not complete yet. It will be complete when Jesus comes. That's why this Bema seat is so important for us to understand. Every one of us, now I have a problem with this one, because the church will never be in the Bema seat. That's the core. But there's a lot of saved people, church members and all, that's going to be in the Bema seat. And the judgment isn't going to be on your sin, that's already taken care of, but it's going to be on how you conducted your life in Christ. If it's acceptable or was not acceptable. You see, you're going to stand before the perfect judge, and that's Jesus. Because our life is supposed to be in him. Our life is supposed to be motivated in and around everything connected with him. And I'll show you that in a minute. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Why is it that temptations and trials bog us down to the point that we ponder about leaving the Lord? I know I'm talking to the choir. But every one of us know people that's walked out on the Lord. When the pressure comes, no matter what you're doing, no matter how much encouragement you try to give, they walk out on the Lord. These people weren't walking on the Lord because if you look at verse 8, it said, Whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, you believe, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now I want you to notice the next verse. Receiving the end of your faith. What in the world is that talking about? Listen, when you were saved and I was saved, listen, I didn't know very much. Now I want you to understand, a Jew was educated in God from the very start. That Jew was confirmed to God. Okay? That Jew in that family was confirmed to God at a certain time. All right? And from that certain time, the family would educate that Jewish child in all the things of God. When they became an adult, they were an adult in God. They knew everything about God, but they didn't know him. That's the whole thing. They didn't know him. They knew about him. I was raised up knowing about him. I was confirmed in the Lutheran church. I did not confess my sin. I was too small to confess my sin. I had godparents to confess my sin. No, it did not do anything to me. Yeah, you go through catechism, you go through things like that. But all it is is a knowledge. All it is is a reciting over and over and over again. But these people... Even though they didn't see him, they loved him. And notice it says, received it unto the, uh, received the end of their faith. Now listen, what is it talking about? I'm going to show it to you. Turn your Bible with me to uh, Hebrews. Go back with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Chapter 12. And it spell it out to us. Okay, chapter 12. Listen to this. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside, lay, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so the sin which doeth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now watch it. Looking unto Jesus, the author of and the finisher of our faith. What is your and my faith all about? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So if we could ever grow 
to the point, I remember faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if we could grow in faith by hearing, then, 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 then we're, we're developing a positive approach on our faith because Jesus is the author of our faith. That doesn't mean that, that he's the one that gave it to you. His word is the one that opened the door and the spirit drew you to God and you when you responded by what you heard and were convicted, you were born again. That's when your true faith in God began. Not just the knowledge of God, but the true reality of your relationship with God began because there you moved with faith because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith you cannot please God. You why? Because you have to believe him that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There's your positive. All of that comes right back to the author of our faith, and that's Jesus Christ. But notice he not only says that right there, he went ahead and he said the author of our faith, and, and later on he says the captain of our salvation. So everything evolves around Christ. All right, let's go on. So these people have received the end of their faith. They, they, they understood what Messiah was all about. Now read Hebrews, and a lot of them started departing from Jesus. Okay, when we understand Hebrews, then we understand why people depart from Jesus. Let's go on. He goes on and he says the prophets wanted to know about this. They, they, they prophesied it, but they didn't understand it. So he says in verse 13, Therefore gird up your loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end of the, of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus. Not now. He's talking about end of grace. Now, now, over here in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, For by grace, that's God's unmerited favor, are you saved? Through faith and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. So it goes right back here again. It's not of ourself, it's God. Okay, turn your Bible with me to Titus, the book of Titus, right after Timothy. And, and notice here that grace wants to do something. The Holy Spirit wants to teach us, so does grace. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, for the grace of God that brought salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should be soberly, right, uh, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He ties them both together again. That, that's why in, in witnessing the people, I, I want them to understand that they had sinned against God. I, 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 when I came to the Lord for salvation, I had people witness to me, and I, there was something always, I can't figure it out, always something, I just could not respond to it. But the day that I was saved, I ran to God. And I asked God to forgive me because I had sinned against him. I had violated his law. I had violated his principles. I had violated his character. And when I did that and I put my faith in Jesus Christ, something happened. It happened that very day that I cannot explain. I'll explain it to you in a little bit. To a point. To a point. So, here he says what? He says, to the end of the grace. So, so you, you and I are to allow the grace of God and the Spirit of God to continue to develop us, to continue to, to help us grow in grace and knowledge because there's coming a time that it's going to come to an end. Because when I'm taken out of here, I'm going to see Jesus. John said that over in 1 John. We don't, know, we, we don't know what he looks like, but we know that we will be like he is. He's the author and finisher of our faith. 
And so grace wants to bring us along because grace wants to do its job that when we come to that conclusion, we're going to see Jesus face to face. We won't need grace. We won't need faith. We got it right there. Amen? Amen. But this should be an action going on continually with every one of us. So now he goes on, he says, As obedient children, not fashion yourself according to the former lust in your ignorance. I had a lot of baggage to take care of. The former lust. And I don't know about you, do you know what lust is? It's a desire that the flesh is craving for and it wants pacification. That's something every one of us have a problem with. You can deny it until the cows come home, but you're going to have to deal with it because you've got things in your life it's based on lust. It's based on craving. It's based on your flesh saying, I want this. And a lot of children throw tantrum fits if they don't get it, and even adults. I was talking to a woman. She was... She needed some help and some counseling. She said, I don't know what I'm going to do with my husband. He, he wants to go out and, and, and buy this expensive toy. You see, that's the thing about, about men. They still buy their toys, but they're more expensive. And she said, no. She said, we can't afford it. And he literally threw a tantrum for it and, and said, I'm going to divorce you so I can get what I want. She, the flesh flesh is terrible and that's the whole concept that God wants us to see and it took God working with me and working with me and working with me to realize that lust is a part of the flesh and the flesh wants to be pacified and if I don't put it in check I'm not going to grow in grace and knowledge that's why I'm so thankful that, that he's allowed me to see the things that I understand in the word of God even though I don't know it all he goes on he says but as he that has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all matter of conversation. Because it is written, ye are, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without respect of person judge according to every man's work, pass at the time of your soul journey with fear. I not only have a reverence of God, I have a fear. I have a, a built-in fear when I was home. I, I never got spankings. I got whippings. I would put out a chain fall and whipped. I know what a whipping is. And when, 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 when my stepbrother would say, I'm getting the club or I'm getting the belt, I knew what he was talking about, and I was fearful. I understand that God is a God of consuming fire. But I also understand with his children, he's more compassionate. For whom he loves, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son in whom he receives. He does it differently. But I fear him. I fear him. I not only have a reverence for him, I fear him. And so that's what we're talking about here. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was ordained before the foundation of the world was manifest in these last times for you. For who by him do believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. You notice he's connecting them again? You can't have one without the other. If you say, I believe in Jesus, you also have to say, I believe in God. And I know that I will never see God. I can't see God and live. But I have God in my heart because of his Son. And his son is the one that enables me to say Father in heaven and his son is the one who allows me to see in him the Father. Wow. Matthew chapter 11 verse 27 says no man knows the Father except me and those who I reveal him. 
Wow. Then he goes on, he says, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love, love without hypocrisy of the brethren. Wow. I, I, can't, I have a hard time getting a hold of that. This, this verse tells me that if I'm a child of God and the Spirit of God has shed abroad in my heart, I should have an unfeigned love purely in my heart for the brother and sisters in the Lord. That's unconditional, isn't it? Why do we have a problem with that? You say, I don't. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. If there's anybody in this church family that you can't love, you got a problem. Why? Because if I understand if God the Father is working and God the Son is working and the Holy Spirit is working, He's the one who will be able to enable me to love people if I let Him love them through me. We get so judgmental. You remember the book of uh, Philemon? You remember there was a slave, Onesimus, that ran from his master, went to Rome, and Paul led him to the Lord and became a great, great, mighty man And Paul's help there. And he took him back. And what did Paul tell him? He said, if he owes you anything, he had a right to kill him. He had a right to have him killed. He said, if he, he have any, if he owes you anything, put it to my charge. You talk about love. Whew. When somebody comes up and gripes to you about somebody in the church, say, I'm sorry, I've already taken that charge to myself, so you're, you're criticizing me too. That's a tough thing to do. That's what this is talking about. You see, a lot of times we read the Bible and we don't read it. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God. There it is. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now, chapter 2. What happened? Well, preachers are having a problem with verse 1. Scholars are having a problem with verse 1. Why does verse 1 show up as verse 1. What is he saying? Wherefore lay aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envies and evil speaking. Why? Well, let's go to Ephesians for a moment. Ephesians for a moment. Paul, give us a little insight on that. Verse 17 of chapter 4. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. See, there's our problem. We don't walk according to our heart, we walk according to our mind. Okay? Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with, God, with, with, with uh, greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so, be that he has heard, that, that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put off, put on the new man which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness Wherefore, put away lying, speak, and speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one another. Be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace 
unto the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit wherein you are sealed of the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and, mal and, and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. That means pouting. And ye and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Wow. So we're back here. That's why verse 1's here. He's already established what God has done for us, and now we look at verse 1 and realize we have a sin nature. That's why there's verses here. He's helping us to realize, wait a minute, I got a sin nature. And this nature that I have is powerful, and it's going to demand its rights. It wants to be pacified. It wants to be angry. It wants to hate people who, who hate them. It wants to do things bad to people who have done bad things to them. That's why that verse is here. But he goes on. Now watch this. You have to watch the transition. The transition says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. So, so I'm going to ask you, the day that you were saved, was there a desire for the word, the milk of the word, that you might grow? Was there a desire for the milk of the word? Now, according to Hebrews, you can stay stuck or you can be weaned off the bottle and you can go on into maturity by eating the meat and the vegetables and all of that. But if you get stuck in the, mil in the milk, you'll never grow. Now, now, here's the reason why. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Peter tasted that the Lord was gracious the day that Jesus looked at him he had denied him and Peter got it and went out and wept bitterly. That's when Jesus became precious to me. When I realized what he did. Then he goes on and he says, now watch this, in homecoming, as unto a levied stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Notice the word precious. Notice verse 3, the gracious, the Lord is gracious. Now he says he's precious. He also are living stones that build up on a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion the chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth in him shall not be confounded. You'll never be confused. But aren't we confused a lot? He said if you do this, you'll never be confused. Well, unto you therefore which believe he is precious, Unto them which is dis disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made a head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light, which in times past you were not a people, but now the people of God, which has not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Look what he has done. According to Revelation, he never remembers me by Charles Johnston. He remembers me as his child. Amen? Look how much he has done. I wonder sometimes, not to be a judge and jury, but I wonder sometimes where this graciousness of Jesus this preciousness of Jesus comes in. 
I think if, if both of those were there, our worship would take on a whole different picture. We'd be glad to come in the house of God, not to go through rituals, <laughs> but to praise, praise Him, honor Him, worship Him, and give Him praise and thanksgiving for what He has done. I remember when this church had youth and so forth, youth would get up and they'd sing songs and just thrill our heart. We had adults that would get up and sing songs and just thrill our heart. <laughs> These things aren't happening anymore. And, and, and we're, we're sensing it. We know it. But Jesus says, and I thank him for it, I stand at the door and knock. That's a church. I don't use it in soul winning. Sorry. I don't do it. That's a church. His church. There to see you. He said, I stand in a just one. One will open that door. I will come in and sup with you. There could be one person that their excitement in feasting with Jesus can change the course of the church if they don't snuff it out. Amen? I hope I've given you something to think about. Think about. Let's bow in prayer and dismissal prayer. Brother Marv, will you dismiss us, please? Thank you.